Good evening and welcome to our regular meeting of the Board of Commissioners for the month of May 2019. I would ask our Acting Township Manager and Secretary and also our Finance Director Amy Cuthbertson to please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Here. Mr. Oliva. Here. Mr. McCluskey. Here. Mr. Siegel. Here. Mr. McGarity. Here. Dr. Hart. Here. Mr. Wexler. Here. Mr. Holm. Here. Mr. Lewis. Here. Would you all please rise and join our Chief of Police, John Viola, in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Chief. Number two on the agenda this evening is the much in anticipated swearing in of our new township manager, David R. Berman. David is joined here tonight by his wife, Jessica, and his daughter, Kyle, a daughter, son, Kyle, I'm sorry, sorry and daughter, Gab Gabrielle. Uh, we thank them for being here, and to do the swearing in honors this evening will be the Honorable District Justice Robert R. Burke. So what I'd like to do is uh, have the swearing in and then maybe have the family take a picture, and then we'll include the whole board because I'm sure you don't want us all in, in, that, in the family picture. So, Judge and the Berman family, if you could come forward, please. State your name. David R. Berman. Do solemnly affirm. Do solemnly affirm. That I will support, obey, and defend. That I will support, obey, and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of this Commonwealth. And the Constitution of this Commonwealth. And that I will discharge the duties of my office. And that I will discharge the duties of my office. With fidelity. With fidelity. That I have not paid or contributed. That I have not paid or contributed. Or promised to pay or contribute. Or promised to pay or contribute. Either directly or indirectly. Either directly or indirectly. Any money or other valuable thing. Any money or other valuable thing. To procure my appointment as township manager. To procure my appointment as township manager. Slash secretary of the township of Haverford. Slash secretary of the township of Haverford. Except for necessary and proper expre uh, expenses. Except for necessary and proper expenses. Expressly authorized by law. Expressly authorized by law. That I have not knowingly violated. That I have not knowingly violated. Any law of this commonwealth. Any law of this commonwealth. Or procured it to be done by others. Or procured it to be done by others. In my behalf. In my behalf. That I will not knowingly receive. That I will not knowingly receive directly or indirectly directly or indirectly any money or other valuable thing any money or other valuable thing for the performance or non-performance for the performance or non-performance of any act or duty of any act or duty pertaining to my office pertaining to my office other than what that other than the compensation allowed by law other than the compensation allowed by law Congratulations, sir. Oh, you want me to know? Oh, okay. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Let's take one with the whole board. Do you guys want to get a picture with the board, too? Oh, <laughs> 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 so that 
never say it, huh? I first uh, want to thank, on behalf of the board, uh, Amy Cuthbertson for her leadership and exceptional stewardship and management of Township Affairs uh, during this interim period. So thank you, Amy Cuthbertson. Amy, she got an A+. Plus. A++, plus plus, right? A 4.3. It was on a... Uh, also, obviously, I want to congratulate Dave uh, on his new position, and we have every confidence that he's going to exceed our expectations as a board and as a community. So, welcome. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, David told me beforehand a couple weeks ago that he wasn't certain if his daughter Gabrielle would be here this evening because of a softball game. So. Uh, one good thing for the rain, I guess, is that she's here. Otherwise, she'd probably be playing softball. So thanks for being here. Uh, item number three on the agenda this evening is a raise for peace recognition award given to our own Deputy Chief Joe Hagan. I'd like to first preface this award by just I did a little search about the race for peace this afternoon. And I just want to tell you a little bit about the organization um, before, because it, it kind of goes to how important this this organization is, as well as how uh, uh, significant this recognition is for our own Deputy Chief Joe Hagan. So the Race for Peace, uh, about the Race for Peace, we say communications, understanding, and trust are forged during times of peace, not during times of conflict and stress. We must strive to create enthusiasm in our communities, see through their eyes, understand their needs, and deliver more than they expect. We do this by delivering reachable goals and solutions that support peace through our communities, saving lives. And they have a number of very uh, admirable goals uh, each year, including ongoing continuous dialogue with the, com the communities and the police, mentoring the youth, connecting police and seniors, developing incentive programs that will promote uh, peace, visiting prisons annually, and ending violence and bringing peace to all communities in our region and our country. And they have a very distinguished and diverse uh, group of committee members, including police, clergy, uh, community activists, business leaders, lawyers, prison officials, and public officials. And here tonight, i um, very pleased that the founder uh, could be here with us tonight, the founder and chairperson of the Race for Peace. Uh, we thank you for being here tonight to present this award. Uh, welcome, Andrew Howe. Thank you for being here. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the appointed and elected officials for lending us their police department all the time. And we have the same name, Andy and Andrew. But uh, <laughs> before I really present Joe the award, I would like Commissioner Kevin McCluskey to have a few words. And John Viola, please. 
Just real quickly, I've had the uh, privilege of participating in some of the uh, events that the Race uh, for Peace has had. Um, and it's a privilege that we in Hereford Township uh, can be involved with an organization such as this that is really striving uh, to bring a greater understanding between the citizens and the police force and, and develop the type of unity that we need a, as communities, um, one where everybody learns from each other through mutual understanding of what the job that the police are trying to do, but also that the residents can express to the police directly through open forums and communication as to how they're feeling and to what they're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. So it really is a, a tremendous organization. And if you uh, have met Andrew, uh, you know that he's tireless and he is his personality is infectious, uh, and he likes to take pictures by holding up uh, a, a single finger. And, and, and the concept is that it takes one, and it's really a great message that it really just takes one person to make a difference in, in, in the communities and in the world. And we're, we're thrilled tonight that he's uh, going to give an award to uh, our own Deputy Chief Joe Hagan, who is certainly a, a tremendous asset here to our Harvard Police Department. Um, and we're thrilled to have Andrew here, and we hope that uh, we can continue the relationship uh, for years to come. So. I uh, met Andrew a few years ago uh, when he called me cold one day. I didn't know who this guy was. I had to call Lower Murray and to see uh, what his story was. But as the commissioner said, he's infectious. Uh, he brought us all on board. Uh, we understood what his goal was, and, and we've been working tirelessly since then. We visit uh, communities. We visit churches. Uh, we've been to uh, the uh, mall. Uh, it's It's been... Uh, uh, continually always trying to bring people closer together. So I applaud Andrew more than anything. Joe, uh, he's been on board from day one with me. And, and like I said, we applaud Andrew for a job well done. And he just continues to move forward, try to do the best for his community. So Andrew. At this time, I would like to present Deputy Chief Joseph Hagan with the Race for Peace Award. But before that, what I see in front of me is a father, a husband, a friend of the community. I see a human being being human. Whenever you need something from Joe, Andrew, how fast do you need it? When do you need it? I mean, this guy is always on board. He's totally engaged with the community that he serves, and we love this guy. And we love the commissioners. We love everybody that participates with the Race for Peace, so I won't hold you any further. Certificate of Appreciation presented to Deputy Chief Joseph Hagan, Township of Haverford. Race for Peace Committee presents this certificate in recognition of your active participation and support in the mission of peace and humanity. We love you, Joe. I just want to thank Andrew and the Board of Commissioners and the Chief. Uh, this is a great organization to be involved in. Um, we've been in different areas of not only the five-county area, uh, meeting in mosques, uh, churches, um, actually we're down the Juvenile Justice Center in Philadelphia, meeting young people trying to make a difference in their life and give them a change and give them some hope. So I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Once again, thank you so much, board. Thank you, Andrew. Congratulations, Deputy Chief Hagan, and thank you, Andrew, for being here this evening. Item number four on our agenda this evening is um, recognition of National Police Week, and we have a proclamation to, to be presented, and also we want to recognize the Police Officer of the Year for 2019. And to make those proclamations, or to give those proclamations this evening, our, our, is our uh, Chair of the Police Committee, Subcommittee of the Board of Commissioners, uh, Commissioner Steve D'Amelio, and obviously Chief Viola will be involved as well. So. Uh, the police week first, Steve. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. It's an honor for me to be here once again to uh, to do this proclamation for the uh, proclaiming the National Police Week. So this proclamation reads: Proclaiming National Police Week and Police Officers Memorial Day, 
whereas the police officers of Hereford Township have worked devotedly and selflessly on behalf of the people of Hereford Township, regardless of the peril or danger to themselves, and whereas these officers have safeguarded the lives and property of the residents of Hereford Township, and whereas these men and women, by their patriotic service and their dedicated efforts, have earned the gratitude of the residents of Hereford Township. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed, the commissioners of Hereford Township calls upon its residents to observe the week of May 12, 2019, as Police Week. Be it further proclaimed that the commissioners of Hereford Township calls upon the community to observe May 15, 2019, as National Police Officers Memorial Day, in honor of those law enforcement law enforcement officers who, through their courageous deeds, have made the ultimate sacrifice in the service to their community. Proclaiming this 13th day of May, 2019, Township of Hereford Board of Commissioners, Andy Lewis, President, and David R. Berman, Township Manager. Commissioners, thank you for my back. So tonight we will honor the Police Officer of the Year. The Department, Haverford Township Police Department, in 2011 began to honor one of its own members. This honor was designated as Officer of the Year. The award recognizes outstanding individual performance from an officer that exhibits a commitment to the profession and exceptional achievement over the previous year. Candidates for Officer, officer of the Year are nominated by the supervisors of the Police Department. Then the supervisors, through a majority vote, select one candidate as the department's officer of the year. So there was many good officers who were nominated. Uh, uh, Mike, uh, through the vote, uh, came out on top, and we're very proud to have Mike as our officer of the year. So if I can read a little synopsis of Mike's career, where he is today. The 2019 officer of the year is Officer Mike Travellini. Officer Travellini was hired September 7, 2011, and is his ninth year. He's currently assigned to the detective division. He's also a hostage negotiator on the Drug Task Force. Mike's a graduate of Cabrini College and Temple University Police Academy. And this is from his supervisors. Officer Travellini is quiet, but he's strong presence within patrol squad. He's always willing and able to do what was ever asked of him. He's quick to volunteer and help him with processing paperwork and evidence. His super supervisors call him an ultimate team player. Officer Travellini has received one life saving award for a possible suicidal subject who was on a roof near a chimney and clearly, clearly distraught and control, out of control emotionally. Mike climbed down into the roof and was able to de-escalate the situation and calm the person. He used his training, training as a negotiator and his quiet demeanor to bring the person off the roof, avoiding a potential tragedy. This past December, Mike was awarded an individual accommodation of merit for his response to stabbing the 3500 block at Darby Road. He received flash, flash information on the subject and encountered, encountered the male suspect near the incident and was able to successfully deploy his taser and incapacitate the suspect yet to ignore the officer's commands while carrying his scissors. He was taken into custody without, without injury. As a result of Mike's investigation into narcotic trafficking, an investigation which took months resulted in an arrest which took a drug trafficker off the street and the seizure of $16,000 in drug money. Michael, Mike has also received one distinguished unit accommodation. Officer Travellini is here tonight with his wife, Megan, his new, new baby daughter, Isabel Rose, his mother and father, Michael and Diane, his in-laws, Joe and Joan Murray, his many family members, including his brother, Nick, who is a patrol officer in the Philadelphia Police Department, 15th District. Mike's grandfather was also an inspector in the Philadelphia Police Department. We are very proud of all of our officers who do an outstanding job on a daily basis, often without recognition. Michael, congratulate this 2019 officer. <laughs> Now I'll read the proclamation for Mike. Police Officer of the Year 2019. Whereas Officer Mike Travellini has performed diligently and faithfully the duties and services required of him by the Township of Hereford, and whereas the performance of Officer Mike Travellini was in the highest standard of the law enforcement profession, and whereas a vote 
has been taken by the police department supervisory staff to recognize officer Mike Trevelyan's outstanding contributions. Now, therefore be it proclaimed that officer Mike Trevelyan is hereby commended for his diligent and valuable service. Presented this 13th day of May, 2019, Township Hire for Board of Commissioners, Stephen D'Amelio, the Chair of Police Committee, and David R. Berman, Township Manager. Mike, congratulations. <laughs> You'll do anything, right? Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for being here. Thanks. Okay. Back to the agenda. Agenda item number five is the township auditor. Update Ross Anderson. First off, I would say congratulations to those police officers. Those awards are well deserved. I also want to apologize. I've missed this past few months due to a few broken noses, struck throat, being lost in the mountains. But I'm back. I'm here. Um, Welcome back. Thank you. All right, so I reviewed the expenditures and warrants for this meeting. I found no irregularities, and all my, benef my questions were answered to my satisfaction. I'm still wondering how that shot went in last night. <laughs> Aren't we all? Yeah. As a Hail Mary, if there ever was one. <laughs> I guess it's quiet, quiet limit. <laughs> Ross, Thank well, you, Ross. Two views uh, dropped while you were gone, oh. so hopefully we'll. <laughs> okay, item number six is the Citizens Forum. We have allocated 20 minutes for registered speakers and also 20 minutes for anyone in the audience that would like to speak on an agenda item. If you want to speak on a non-agenda item, you'll have that opportunity under agenda item number 22. So we had four registered speakers um, at the, at this morning, and we lost one uh, who's going to actually present uh, next month instead. So we have three registered speakers. Uh, the first to speak tonight is Geraldine Pop. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Good evening. Yes, thank you. I'm going to first give you a little bit of a history of the issue that was a problem for me. Uh, in 1989, the back wall of the quarry fell in, and uh, it collapsed, leaving seven members of the street that I live on, is Joanna Road, and we were out of our house for a year. So the quarry had a real close space in my heart, and um, it le then it filled up with 300 feet of water from the, qu from the golf course. So then they filled it and reconstructed the quarry. And uh, with it became a swale, which is the water that comes from the golf course goes into this, the stream. We went to court, and at that time it was determined that the township would build the swale and that the quarry owner would maintain the swale and keep it clean. As I shopped, I noticed that trash 
and uh, things were accumulating in the swale. And knowing that Darby Township had a lot of trash that ended up in their township and caused great trouble for them, for businesses and homes, I felt bad and reported it to Mr. Wexler. I also spoke to the Parks Department. <coughs> Mr. Wexler was right on top of things and got some help for, and also spoke to the owner of the quarry about maintaining the swale because in court that was determined that that was his opportunity and his responsibility. Uh, there was paper, trash bags, uh, um, plastic bags, uh, bottles, plastics, and a mattress and other things that people had thrown into the swale. And that, that would cause another, because I think Darby Township did have um, business and homes that were ruined last year, and I didn't want that to repeat. So I offer my thanks to Mr. Wexler for getting right on the money and um, correcting that. I think that the uh, swale will be cleaned and maintained, and uh, I appreciate that. Uh, may I say in closing, every day is Earth Day. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Geraldine. And uh, I did talk to, with Commissioner Wexler this afternoon, and I understand he did take action and talk to the owner, so hopefully you have a, a, solution, a solution going forward that's permanent that you don't have to you know, call next time. So thank you for your comments. Uh, the next speaker, registered speaker this evening, is Hannah Turlish. Good evening. We got three minutes, right? You can. That would be that would be good. <laughs> so you might remember me from a few months ago, but if you don't, uh, my name is Hannah Turlish, and I live at 412 Mill Road. I wanted to speak tonight for a few minutes about an event that I'll be attending tomorrow evening for people that have children in the township's public schools. My son is a first grader at Chestnut World Elementary. The title of the event is uh, Parent and Guardian Forum on Equity and Inclusion. And the district has organized this event to, I'm gonna quote from the invitation, to quote, lean into important equity, diversity, and inclusivity conversations to deepen understanding, and to support our students and families, unquote. Registration for the event filled up within a few days. There is clearly a high demand for participating in this work as a community. I would be more than happy to provide you with a written overview of the conversation tomorrow night, or to meet with those of you who are interested to learn what questions parents are asking and to learn what concerns they have about diversity and inclusion in the township. I'm also eager to meet with members of our Township's Human Relations Commission, which has really done great work organizing events like last night's November, uh, last, excuse me, last November's Implicit Bias Workshop, and they should be encouraged to continue that dialogue township-wide. Just to, for a few statistics, um, according to a recently released uh, comprehensive study conducted by an organization called Teaching Tolerance, more than two-thirds of educators witnessed a hate or bias incident in their school just in the fall of 2018 alone. And the aggression was aimed primarily at students of color and LGBTQ children. The study also reported that no one was disciplined in 57% of those cases. The picture that emerges out of the entire study is the opposite of what schools should be. And I should know because I've worked in schools for 25 years. Schools are places where all students feel welcome or should feel welcome. They should feel safe and feel supported by the adults who are responsible for their well-being. But schools are not hermetically sealed institutions. In fact, this outbreak of aggression in schools reflects what is happening outside of the school walls. Hate crimes are rising. And I am committed as a citizen of this wonderful township to do what I can to combat intolerance in our community. And I will be a highly engaged participant in tomorrow night's forum. I invite you to connect with me after tomorrow night to learn more. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Hannah. I, I know I would be interested in getting that overview, and if you could maybe distribute it to the board, that would be helpful. Uh, as you know, we do have a Human Relations Commission that was formed in 2011 to try to, um, you know, protect us against dis discrimination. Um, and they've worked actively along with um, HCAN. And I think if we can work in a collaborative way with the school district, you know, we can certainly um, do go a long way to try to to to, um, to work on the issue of diversity and inclusion. So, thank you for your comments. Uh, Fourth speaker this evening is Connor Quinn. Third speaker, I should say. Supposed to be four, but he's third. Well, I might need uh, the extra time because I was blessed with a thing called a stuttering. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my my name is uh, Connor Quinn, and I am the uh, Republican candidate uh, for seventh ward uh, commissioner in uh, this township. I've lived in uh, this town uh, my whole whole life, and I hope to uh, continue the growth that our township has uh, experienced over the, over the past 10 years. In the many statewide polls, we, we, are, ra are, we are rated as one of the mo most desirable communities to live in, and we, and we are among the, sa uh, uh, we are among, uh, the safest co or, uh, communities thanks to, a, thanks to a dedicated police force, and, and our schools are ranked high both in uh, the state and uh, around uh, the United States. We have a, vi a, vi vi a vibrant di a bi or a business community, and I'm proud to be a part of it. There is so much uh, uh, to be excited about in uh, this town township with, uh, with uh, unique communities who, like, who uh, support Township events like ha ha like like uh, have it for Township Day and the and uh, the and the uh, Kelly Spring event and uh, and uh, however we we have to recognize the, these or uh, these challenges such as the o o or uh, the op or uh, the opioid cri crisis that has seeped into our town. I've been, been involved in uh, the ha in in uh, the Haverford Drug Alliance Science Group, the drug aware uh, or awareness group, from its uh, beginning, and I know of or uh, from personal experience how bad that 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 can be, and we will win that war. And uh, we also need uh, 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 to study some or uh, some alternative ways to. Combat the trap or uh, traffic in our town, and these are more than ward, ward problems. These are town problems, and I hope to work with all this or to all of you guys in uh, the year, years to come. And I've attended and I've attended uh, these meetings since I was in high, high since I was in high school a very long time ago, and I know mo mo like most of you really well, and I know that we can work as one. And, and I'd also like to thank Jim, uh, or is, uh, Jimmy McGarity for his uh, support and faith in me to uh, continue to help the town, town, township move, like move forward. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Connor. I uh, thank you for that commercial for our township. Um, certainly is a great place to live and raise a family and work, so. Um, it's only going to get better now that Mr. Berman's on board, right, David? Absolutely. <laughs> so thank you for your comments. That concludes the uh, registered speaker portion of our agenda. Uh, are there anyone, is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak on an agenda item this evening? Okay, hearing none, we'll now turn to item number seven on the agenda, which is the approval of the minutes of our regular meeting of April 8th. Mr. Chairman. Mr. D'Amelio. Make a motion to approve the regular meeting minutes of April the 8th, 2019. Second. Mr. Siegel, moved by Mr. D'Amelio, seconded by Commissioner Siegel. Any corrections, edits, additions, or comments on the minutes? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Ayes carried. Thank you. Item number eight is approval of the warrants. Vice President Holmes. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I move we approve warrant number five of 2019, totaling $5,944,780.44, comprising the general and sewer fund payroll for April 18, 2019, 
in the amount of $680,337.16, general and sewer fund payroll from May 2nd, 2019, in the amount of $603,854.21, general fund disbursement December 5, 2019, in the amount of $2,024,092.70, Sewer fund disbursements number five, 2019, in the amount of $51,649.44. Community development block grant fund disbursement number five, 2019, in the amount of $109,247.78. Capital projects fund disbursement number five, 2019, in the amount of $232,496.30. Pennsylvania Office of Unemployment Compensation Benefits, first quarter of 2019, in the amount of $495.90. Debt service on the 2014 general obligation issue, interest in the amount of $149,558.75. Debt service on the 2016 general obligation issue, interest in the amount of $123,000. $941.25. Debt service on the 2018 general obligation issue, interest in the amount of $1,963,473.75. And a credit card statement ending April 27, 2019, in the amount of $5,633.20. Second. Uh, moved by Commissioner Holmes, seconded by Commissioner Siegel. Any discussion or question? Uh, this warrant is slightly larger than our, our typical warrant is because it has the biannual uh, interest uh, charge in our debt service and three of our general obligation bonds. Um, our auditor has been through all the warrants, uh, and uh, any questions that were raised by him have been answered to his satisfaction. Um, and uh, based upon that, uh, at my own review, uh, I recommend that we approve warrant number five. Thank you, Commissioner Holmes. Um, all in favor of approving the warrant signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Ayes carry. Thank you. Item number nine, uh, Finance Department Tax Assessment Appeal. President Holmes. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I move we approve tax, the tax assessment appeal for DC Folio number 22-03-00842-00, also known as 4 and 6 East Eagle Road, the settlement stipulation agreement pending in the Court of Common Pleas of Delaware County under docket number 2017-10-10357, and authorize counsel and the township officials to execute necessary documents. Second. Second. Second by Commissioner Wexler. Mr. Uh, President. Oh. Yeah. I was just going to say this is something that we discussed at our work session last week. But do you have a, additional discussion yeah, or just questions? To, just to remind people of the three taxing authorities, when, whenever anybody uh, appeals an assessment on their property, um, any of the taxing authorities have the standing to challenge the assessment. And um, the, the, the organization with the most at stake is the school district. They take the laboring ore in all of those fights. And it's to the advantage of the township and the county to just um, uh, basically to follow the lead of the uh, school district. And uh, everybody, as I understand, is on board with this um, uh, with this uh, particular settlement uh, relating to um, the uh, location of four and six East Eagle Road. And uh, uh, as we discussed, it uh, is satisfactory to our solicitor as well as to the board. That's correct. Any other discussion or questions? All in favor of this motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Ayes carried. Thank you. Item number 10 is resolution 2141-2019, Blue Root PennDOT C Mac Grant. Uh, let's move in, let's make this motion second, then we'll have a discussion since this was not on the work session agenda last week. So. I have a motion. Yes, Mr. Siegel. Uh, motion to approve resolution 2149-2019, authorizing the township manager to draft a letter or prepare other necessary documents supporting and endorsing PennDOT's application 
for congestion mitigation and air quality improvement program, known as a CMAC grant, to fund the proposed reconstruction of the Interstate 476 Blue Route northbound interchange and nearby intersections with Westchester Pike and Lawrence Road in Haverford Township. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Oliva. Any discussion? Do you want to? D'Amelio. Oh, Commissioner D'Amelio, I'm sorry. <laughs> that will be into my name. <laughs> yeah. Does Commissioner Siegel, you'd like to give a little background on this? Yeah, this is, this is actually an update uh, of the uh, efforts of the township to work on reconstructing the interchange with Westchester Pike, Lawrence Road, and the northbound Blue Route ramp. Uh, we've had numerous meetings uh, since, uh, I guess we had a, a resolution through Commissioner D'Amelio and I last March um, to, as a result of the construction that's going on in Marple. After that was done, the township met with various stakeholders, including Senator Leach, all of our state representatives, et cetera, and began the process and authorized our township engineer, Dave Pannoni, to begin preparing designs for uh, improving the traffic flow there. There have been a number of meetings, including one last month uh, here at the township to address the process. Uh, at this point, it is estimated that the uh, cost of performing this reconstruction, which would relieve a lot of the stress on the intersection, is approximately $3 million. It had been discussed previously that we would seek uh, inclusion in the next state budget for this work. After the meeting occurred last month, it was decided that the best alternative would be for PennDOT to seek a grant, the CMAC grant, uh, through the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission because that would probably be the more effective and expeditious way to do so. Uh, at the request of Senator Leach's office, who contacted us last week, uh, we have prepared a resolution that sets forth essentially the history that I have just recited um, and would authorize the township manager and uh, Dave Pannoni and his company to prepare uh, the appropriate reports and any other documentation necessary to get this grant approved because once the grant is approved, PennDOT estimates a six-month uh, bidding process and a one-year construction process, so we, and independent of any other projects, including the other construction that's going on on the Marple side. So that's what we're bringing here today, essentially to authorize our support for this project, which I'm sure we all know how necessary it is. Absolutely. Commissioner D'Amelio. Ladies and gentlemen, make no mistake, this is, this is critical. This is very important for Haverford Township, and specifically the areas in the first, the second, the fourth ward. The congestion that we believe is going to be caused by, by this development is, is huge. Now, I'm going to cut it short by saying part of this reconstruction of this area is going to include a separate uh, ramp to go on 476, where uh, there will not be a light. Is that, am I correct, Mr. Pannoni? It's going to bypass the traffic. It's going to bypass the traffic light. We're trying to keep the traffic flowing off of Westchester Pike that, that is heading to the Blue Route North on 476 without touching the light. Am I correct, Chief and, and Dave? Yes. So this is critical. We need this money. We, we I think, it was estimated approximately $3 million. Am I correct, Commissioner Siegel? Yes, that's the latest estimate. The latest estimate was $3 million. I would say it could be a little bit more than that, but um, we need to, to find a, a way to get the state to, to approve this for our area. Anyone who travels that area knows how difficult it is in the morning. It's difficult for the residents in, in our areas, and it's difficult for police and fire departments to get through that area, and it's just getting increasingly worse. And with that development, I, we just don't see an improvement happening. And I'm thinking, uh, Mr. Chairman, that maybe at the next meeting, Mr. Pannoni uh, present uh, something to the entire township as to what that reconstruction would look like and how it would benefit Haverford, if, if that would be okay with this board. I, I think he can, sure, we can do that during the work session. We have some plans. Am I correct, Mr. Pannoni? So maybe he could present those plans to, to all the residents of Haverford Township, because I'm sure it affects everyone that, that has to go by that area whether it's in the morning or afternoon, but 
um, I think it would be a good idea for, for us to show everyone what we're, what we're talking about. Any other, any other comments or discussion? I want to thank Commissioner Siegel, and Commissioner Oliva, and um, Commissioner D'Amelia for their leadership on this, in this particular issue. Um, if there's no other discussion or questions, I would ask David to do his first official roll call vote. <laughs> Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. McGarity. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Wexler. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Then item number 11 is ordinance number P2-2019, Harrifer Reserve Bill of Sale, first reading. Mr. President. Mr. Siegel. Motion to adopt the first reading of ordinance number P2-2019, accepting the transfer of ownership of the sewer lines and related improvements within certain portions of the common elements of Haverford Reserve to carriage homes and authorizing a sanitary sewer and utility and access easement agreement on a portion of the property at 3500 Darby Road, Haverford, Pennsylvania. A second. Second. Second by Commissioner Wexler. Is there any discussion or questions on this ordinance? Seeing none, please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. McGarity. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Wexler. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Agenda item number 12, ordinance number P7-2019, peddling and solicitation, first reading. Mr. President. Commissioner Siegel. Motion to adopt the first reading of ordinance P7-2019, amending and supplementing ordinance number 1960, adopted June 30, 1986, and known as the general laws of the Township of Haverford by further amending and supplementing chapter 130, peddling and solicitation, section 130. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Oliva. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I just ask on 12 and 13, we have a roll call vote, please? We will. Um, is there any uh, any other discussion or questions? Is this, can we go over this one more time? What, what is the cutoff now? Or there, is there a cutoff? Or, but, but for nonprofit, there they could come as, as late as what? Yeah, this, this ordinance amends our prior uh, peddling and solicitation ordinance to address some concerns that were raised uh, about restriction both on political and charitable uh, soliciting within the township. It continues to limit uh, commercial soliciting uh, to dusk to, uh, from, from 9 a.m. to dusk uh, and will now transfer all of the licensing requirements to the police department. Peddlers or solicitors will still be required to obtain a township license and residents uh, will be able to uh, sign up again for the no do not solicit list, which we will promote uh, once assuming this ordinance is passed. The concerns that were raised related to charitable and political uh, soliciting, which as a practical matter, the township really can't regulate on any significant amount because of First Amendment issues. Uh, what this ordinance does, though, is permit such soliciting from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., uh, which would co which covered any of the concerns. It's been addressed extensively by Mr. Burns and uh, Ms. Hayes from his office uh, in terms of all of the language. So that's where we are with this. But it's 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. for political charitable soliciting. Uh, those people do not have to register. Uh, commercial soliciting remains unchanged, except that we've clarified that the police would would be handling all of this. Chief also has concurred as a deputy chief regarding language concerning um, who may or may not be issued the commercial licenses, uh, et cetera. So this has gone through literally every department for approval. Thank you, Commissioner Siegel. Any uh, any other comments or discussion questions? Yes, personally, I uh, I feel, Andy, that 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. is way too long. I've had a lot of seniors call me and say, please, Mr. McGarry, don't vote for this because of the fact that knocking on their door at 9 o'clock at night is way too late, and I totally agree with them. Just, just to also clarify, given what Commissioner Siegel said, that the, the do not solicit list that we have would not apply to the charitable political um, 
solicitation, and that's you know that's just consistent with First Amendment rights and free speech. Including with Supreme Court decision. So with that, his we question is that limit, um, limit the time, so we couldn't limit arbitrarily limit and just set the time at 7 p.m. Would that be some violation or some break some federal law? No, but it it it, it would raise the, the specter of a challenge because particularly in the fall, it doesn't it's not really an issue now if you say till dusk because it's late. But uh, what happened and last year just it happened, but there were no complaints because. The, the police didn't try to enforce the, the ordinance. When you have the time change to uh, standard time in November, a week before the elections, it basically limits candidates, uh, political candidates, to four or five in the afternoon, uh, which is not appropriate. I mean, the reality is, and I get I get complaints, and it's one of the major sort of social media areas of complaint in the township, but we have very, very limited ability to regulate political speech, charitable speech, nor do I think we should. Uh, commercial speech we have, and we continue to be one of the few communities that even regulate soliciting in terms of commercial businesses. Most ordinances in other communities only limit to residential. But if we were to limit political or charitable soliciting to an early time, I do think we could have the specter of of a lawsuit, legal fees, and probably lose, uh, which are not things that I wanted to vote on. So. Let, let me ask you this. What have other townships, what have they done? Have they, I mean, I could see 8 o'clock at night. I'm a little concerned about 9 o'clock in the evening. Um, senior citizens are, I mean, not even seniors. People are afraid to answer the door at 9 o'clock. So is 8 o'clock? Nobody or? has to answer. Well, it's human nature that I get that, Commissioner. But we get a uh, get our opinion of our solicitor. See what he what his thoughts are on this. Kind of like. I think Commissioner Siegel uh, explained it uh, correctly. I mean, the cases don't set out an, an exact time, um, and you know the the um, but the idea of limiting it from four o'clock to four o'clock in the fall is it would be a problem. There's no question about it. And then. You know, then you get into well, what, what's the correct time after that? Is it eight? Is it nine? Is it you know, and it, you know, it's just a problem. But yeah. uh, I think nine's probably the, the the most conservative that we're not going to get sued with that, I guess. And and because uh, I think other other places have gone with those times and not had problems. What does Springfield have? Do you know? Do they have something similar or not? I don't know if yeah. Right. yeah. Many communities don't put a time limit. Don't even address charitable or political to avoid those problems. And you know. Well, I think anyone who knocks on a door at nine at night deserves the yeah slam uh, slam door. Yeah, and uh, and I would agree with the that. lack of a vote uh, that they deserve uh, wouldn't do uh, it. But, you know, you're they're allowed to do it. Uh, I don't I don't want to be seen as restricting free speech uh, for anyone, not protected speech. And so nine o'clock seemed to be. You know, looking at Supreme Court decisions, uh, Kelly Hayes from Mr. Burns' office did a lot of uh, research on this. That was her recommendation. Um, you know, our prior ordinance had it earlier, and I thought it could pass muster, but I don't also want to see us in the middle of a legal battle. I certainly know what legal fees can cost. Yeah, well, with, with experience from the billboard battle. So, uh, any other comments or question discussion? Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. McGarity. Well, I, I just want to make a little statement. I'm not concerned with the rights of the uh, people coming through doing these petitions up until 9 o'clock at night. I'm, I'm concerned about the residents of the 7th Ward and the, all the residents of Haverford Township having to put up with that stuff that late hour of the evening. I vote no. Dr. Hart. Yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Wexler. I'll take the doc. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Holmes. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Agenda item number 13, ordinance number P8, 2019, curbs, second reading. President. Commissioner Siegel. Motion to adopt the second reading of ordinance number P8-2019, amending and supplementing ordinance number 1960 
known as the General Laws of the Township of Haverford, adopted June 30, 1986, Chapter 58, Building Construction, Section 58.2, Additions, Deletions, and Modifications by Modifying the Provisions for Curb Replacement. Seconded by Commissioner Oliva. Any discussion or question? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. Five or six years ago, this was brought up to four inches, and uh, at that time, I voted no. I didn't think that four inches was, I, I didn't feel it was uh, proper, and I still feel that way now, and I believe that three inches is high enough, and uh, I'll stick with that opinion. That's what this ordinance does. So, any, uh, any other questions or uh, comments? Discussion? Uh, Mr. President. Yes. I'm, I'm going to vote no for this because I've been saying for 15 years <laughs> I think we need to take a more comprehensive view of this. But I, I also. I, we can at a later date. Do you want to leave the. Yeah, the I'm, I'm happy to do it at a later date and do the, do the tax analysis for everybody. But more important, for the last couple of years, uh, there's a lot of Haverford Township residents who. Um, had to replace their curbs uh, because of the reveal of four inches. And um, uh, it may seem strange that we have to punish people going forward for people who got punished in the past, but I, there has to be a level of consistency that comes out of this board that people can rely on, that people can, can, can assume they're going to be treated fairly, or else you're just going to think every time this board turns over and some new people come on, you're going to change the curb ordinance or some other ordinance, and then the next door neighbor doesn't have to spend six grand fixing curbs that the other neighbor had to because it just happened to be a year before and the political winds were blowing in a different direction. So I, 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 I I'm not going to support this change. I'm not going to support this ordinance because um, uh, this is not something we should yo-yo around on. And I, I think we should stick with what we very intelligently decided a bunch of years ago after a great deal of public input and a great deal of, um, of. Uh, of discussion, and uh, I'm worried that this is just the start of, of uh, going back and forth on this curve. That we should either deal with it comprehensively or or leave it as it was. Well, I think the history is that it was um, before it was four inches. It was three inches for a long time. I think it was four inches for maybe four or five years. Uh, I support this because um, I think three inches is adequate in terms of a, a reveal and. Look, I mean, if it saves uh, 20 or 30 percent of the residents who are leaving the township from having to replace their curbs, that's a good thing. Because I use, kind of view this as a hidden tax on the way out the door, people leaving this, this township. So I think it's going to result in a net savings to a, a lot of people by reducing the real reveal from four to three inches. And I think uh, hopefully this board will maintain this uh, this ordinance until Mr. Holmes has thoughts and has an analysis provides this board, we certainly can consider that at a future date, but um, I think this is a, is a net plus for all our residents to go from four to three inches and save that 20 or 30 percent that had the three inch reveal um, and not the four inch reveal. So uh, I think it's a net plus for a lot of our residents. So I'm going to, I intend to support this. this ordinance. Any other comments? Yes. Mr. I think it's also important that we understand that I mean, in addition to making the change to three inches, we've done some other things with this ordinance which should yeah. be beneficial to residents. One, we define quite specifically what is a substantial defect, which had not been previously defined uh, or not well defined in the ordinance, so that now when codes goes out, they can say, here are the criteria. Uh, the, while there's always some subjectiveness, this eliminates that, and, you know, the questions that I think codes gets a lot uh, when they're doing the UNO inspections. Uh, so we've defined it significantly. We've also clarified what is the defect within uh, sidewalk height, uh, which is important because that is a major tripping uh, and safety hazard. Uh, moving it to three quarters of an inch. Many communities are at half an inch. We've been at an inch. So I think while the, this is the third vote in my tenure on the board over curb, I, I think those other changes are very important and will allow more clarity for residents selling and probably less 
sort of debate for the inspectors who have to go out and explain things because they can point to the ordinance and say, you know, we have six different criteria here of what constitutes a substantial defect. Uh, Mr. Thank Chairman, you. can I just say that I'm, I'm being involved in Seventh Ward politics for over 50 years. Uh, the plan that's in place for curbing, I have nothing against that. It's a beautiful plan. I believe it should stay intact. The only thing I think that changes is the uh, height, which basically because of the water coming down the street, it's to keep the water in the street and not running all over the place. And dropping it from four to three would also maintain to keep that. I don't, I'm not changing the ordinance at all as far as the other way. I think if a person moves and their curb is in real bad shape, it should be fixed. And they should fix it. I agree with that. Any other comments or discussion? Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to thank the codes department. This brings back, of all the times that you've mentioned, we voted for this three times, this brings some common sense and civility back into the process. It, it, it makes it simpler, it's easy to understand, it's practical, and it's better for the homeowner. So thank you. Any other comments? Uh, I wish I thought we had this discussion in a work session. We're having another work session on this issue. I'm not going to go into it. Go ahead. And um, in fact, I, I've expressed myself on this a couple different times. Um, but I, you know, just just to point out for all the residents, so it so it is clear though, um, you know, if it's below three inches, you're still going to have to get your curb fixed. I mean, it's not we're not eliminating this, and it's not going to, you know, it might, as Commissioner Wexler said. Uh, clarify some 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 of the issues but there's still going to be issues and there's still going to be people who when they're moving out have two and a half inch curb and they're going to be upset that they have to replace their curb and it, the reality is it has to happen at some point and you know my position as I said has been that we should lean towards consistency but okay I won't go on any other mr. president <laughs> <laughs> okay we're back to our work, work session <laughs> No, we're not really, uh, because uh, Dan brought up, a, uh, Mr. Siegel brought up a great point, and I don't want to, um, and, I, and I, I don't want to give credit, I don't want to fail to give credit where credit is due. This ordinance does fix a number of things. It also made a, you know, the, the, the ordinance was drafted, took an excellent suggestion about, you know, we don't have to do an entire stretch of curb if no more than 70% of it needs that. I, I think these are all, th these are, these are excellent clarifications <laughs> to the ordinance as it existed. And so I, I would, I, I would, I mean, and I don't think <coughs> Mr. Siegel's going to accept my request whether he would just take out the section about the three to four inches. Uh, but I will, I will just remind everybody, changing it from four to three inches means fewer curbs will be replaced in our town. It will take longer for us to have the, the, to have uniform curbing throughout the township. So when the house is sold and it would have been repaired six months ago, now it won't get repaired. People who own that house for the next 10 years, really the next time it'll be examined is the next time that house is sold. So as a township, since we are putting it on the township residents to be the ones responsible for having a good system of curbs throughout our township, we are taking a step here that's going to delay that process of getting all these curbs replaced in our town. So um, that, that is a consequence of this. Now that is also the consequence is that a number of people will be able to sell their homes and not have to repair their curbs until they do it. And they'll just be put off for another day. But that's just put off. And I think until we're prepared to take on the whole duty of doing everybody's curbs, <coughs> but recognize how important they are in our neighborhoods that I don't think we should take steps that, that, that reduce the amount of the work that's going to be done and lengthens out the amount of time that substandard curb will stay in place. You don't have to replace it if you own it two and three quarters and two and a half and two, only if it breaks up and disappears entirely. So just extending the length of substandard curbing throughout the township. That's all. So I'll ask Mr. Siegel because uh, it's it's an exercise worth doing, even if it is futile. Um, would you accept an amendment to your ordinance where we uh, did not accept, we did not make the one revision from four inches to three inches on the curb reveal? No. Yeah. Well, <laughs> who has a dollar? <laughs> so, anyway, that, one, that is one thing. all I have. Okay, thank you. One thing I want to uh, ensure going forward uh, through our public works uh, director uh, and our new township manager 
Um, I think this has been the case for the last 15 or 20 years uh, since, since Doc was our public works director. Uh, I mean, I don't think curbs sink. I think what's happened over the years is that as we repave roads, we've taken off, for example, an inch and put back an inch and a half. That's what's happened. So that's our, that's the township's uh, fault for doing that over the course of, a, you know, whatever it is, 50, 60 years. So I think going forward is what we have, we have to make sure is when a road is repaved, uh, that we actually take measurements of the curb height to make sure that if we mill an inch and a half, that we don't put more than an inch and a half back on that street. So I talked to our public works director about that, and I think we have to come up with a program to work with Catania engineers, whoever it might be, to ensure that we're not putting back more blacktop than we extracted. So I, I'm sure the rest of the board agrees on that point. So I, I agree with you, Andy, and that's basically what the problem's been over the years is that a lot of uh, different wards, the millage wasn't done because that particular commissioner didn't want it done. I mean, I'm only telling you since I've been commissioner there in 28 years, they always milled in my ward because that way you don't lose any curb. But in other words, if you don't mill, you'll get another, we'll say, another full block done. So that's, that's what we're talking about. So just make it in the ordinance that it has to be milled every street. Okay. Dave, will you make sure of that? <laughs> you oversee our, with our, working with our public works director to make sure that. Just since, we're making, uh, uh, just since we're making a record on that, though, I mean, there is the issue of if another utility company tears up the road. For instance, they're doing PICO work in, in my ward right now. Um, you know, they're going to pave that portion of the oh, road. We want to check that, make sure that. I cert we certainly are going to try to check that and, and maintain that. But it's not, it's also just so Dave knows part of what we're looking at is not just our own paving. Yeah, exactly. Good point. Um, any other discussion or questions? That's good. I think we exhausted this topic. Uh, if you would uh, please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. No. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. No. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. McGarity. No. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Wexler. Yes. Mr. Holmes. No. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Yeah. Five four. Five, Five four. four. Five four in favor. So the ordinance passes. Next agenda item is ordinance number 89-2019, amendment chapter 30, pension pension employee benefits, second reading. Mr. President. President, I, I move we adopt the second reading of ordinance P9 of 2019, uh, amending chapter 30, pension and employee benefits to include early retirement with actuarial reduction option. Second. Second by Commissioner Wexler. Mr. President, this is the second reading on this, and just for those folks in the audience who didn't hear it the first time, uh, this is uh, creating a, an early retirement program that has no uh, has no mathematical uh, effect of, of any substance on um, our actuarial uh, health. Um, folks take a reduced benefit if they go out earlier uh, at a certain time in their retirement. So um, you've heard a lot of, uh, over the years, we've heard a lot of bad press about DROP and other similar programs, but done properly, which is what this is done. Um, it treats, it gives uh, retirement opportunities to folks who are prepared to take it earlier than, than, than the system is uh, set up to accommodate, um, but there is an actuarial analysis and reduction that takes place um, that makes up for the uh, increased length of, anticipated length of the, uh, of the retirement. Okay, any other comments or questions? Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. McGarity. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Wexler. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Agenda item number 15, ordinance number P10, 2019, traffic second reading. Mr. President. Commissioner Holmes. I'm Mr. President, I move we adopt the second reading of ordinance number P10 of 2019, authorizing the removal of a traffic restriction on a uh, particular highway. Uh, Beechwood Bridge at Northeast and the Beechwood Bridge to the Southwest uh, from Beechwood Drive and, La and Lakeside Avenue and from Caracop Drive onto Beechwood uh, Bridge. There was previously a, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, let me finish it. 
Um, from Haverford Township Ordinance, Section 175-78, Schedule 3, One-Way Highways, Beachwood Bridge Northeast, from Beachwood Drive and Lakeside Drive entrance onto the Beachwood Bridge entrance, Monday through Friday from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., and the Beachwood Bridge from the Southwest, from Caracom Drive onto the Beachwood Bridge entrance, Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. Be happy to second that. Yeah, these were one-way restrictions that were put into place uh, decades ago. Um, but are now uh, unmanageable and uh, due to the closing of the Manoa Bridge. Um, and um, obviously we've already rescinded this once and I recommend we do it again. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions or discussion? Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. McGarity. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Wexler? Yes. Mr. Holmes? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. I would, before we on, if I could, before we move on, if I could just make a pitch. There are a lot of folks from Haverford Township now who are now driving across this bridge at these times that previously they hadn't. Um, I would just ask you all, this is a very tightly confined neighborhood, fairly densely uh, populated and not used to the traffic that is now going through there because of the detour of the Manoa, uh, of Manoa Road. Um, so I just ask all of you to drive through that area with extra vigilance um, and extra care. And I ask uh, for uh, the residents there to be patient while we go through this, uh, this temporary uh, chain in traffic <laughs> flow, you know, tra traffic amount volume because of the change in Manoa. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Uh, agenda item number 16, resolution number 2134-2019, Soul Smart designation. This is an initiative uh, by our Environmental Advisory Committee um, to make our community uh, more inviting to solar, alternative, another alternative energy source. So, um, an important initiative, and uh, I want to commend the EAC and our staff for uh, applying for this designation. So, entertain a motion, Mr. M uh, President, uh, to adopt the resolution number 2134 2019 that uh, the board hereby supports the efforts of staff to prepare necessary applications and documentation to apply for Soul Smart designation, setting it apart from its commitment to encouraging alternative energy sources. Second. Uh, seconded by Commissioner McGarity. Any questions or discussion? Great Please idea. Good work. Yes, great work. Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. <laughs> yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. McGarity. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Wexler. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Agenda item number 17, resolution number 2135-2019. Greenways, Trails, and Recreation Program grant application. Mr. President, motion to adopt resolution number 2135 2019, authorizing the township manager to submit a 2019 Greenways, Trails, and Recreation grant application in the amount of $250,000 from the Commonwealth Financing Authority to be used for the acquisition of 224 Foster Avenue and the redevelopment of that property into a greenway and designating it the township and designating the township manager to act exec all documents and agreements between the township and the commonwealth financing authority second moved by commissioner hart second time coming on this mcgarity uh, any questions or discussion please call the roll mr d'amelio yes mr oliva yes mr mccluskey yes mr siegel yes Mr. McGarity? Yes. Dr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Wexler? Yes. Mr. Holmes? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Agenda item number 18, resolution number 2136-2019, Greenways, Trails, and Recreation Program grant application. Mr. President, I'd like to make a motion to adopt resolution number 2136-2019, authorizing the township manager, to, township manager to submit a 2019 Greenways, Trails, and Recreation grant application in the amount of $213,000 from the Commonwealth Financing Authority to be used for modifications to an unnamed tributary to the 
the uh, Darby Creek to accommodate the future extension of the Darby Creek Trail and design, I'm sorry, <coughs> designating the um, Township Manager to ex execute all documents and agreements between the Township and the Commonwealth Financing Authority. Second. Seconded by Commissioner D'Amelio. Any questions or discussion? Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. McGarry. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Wexler. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Agenda item number 19, resolution 2137-2019, flood mitigation program grant application. Mr. President. Commissioner uh, Hart. Oh. Motion to adopt resolution number 2137, 2019, authorizing the township manager to submit a 2019 flood mitigation grant application in the amount of $500,000 from the Commonwealth Financing Authority to be used for the construction of an underground retention facility within Chatham Glen Park and designating the township manager to execute all documents and agreements between the township and the Commonwealth Financing Authority. Second. Seconded by Mr. Gary. Any Mr. President, this discussion? Is the earlier um, sure. grant uh, application of, or both to kind of address the stormwater problems that we've had in the lower part of the eighth ward. Um, certainly, if things have been better since the installation of um, the at Jason Chatham yeah. Park, but this you know still issues. Need things done. Any other questions? Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. McGarry. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Wexler. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Agenda item number 20, resolution number 2138-2019, final land development plan for Republic Bank. Mr. President. Mr. McCluskey. Motion to adopt resolution 2138-2019. 2019 approving the final land development for Republic Bank for the property located at 2400 Darby Road, Havertown, Hereford Township, Delaware County, and known as DC Folio number 2203-00690-00, has been submitted to construct a 3,028 square foot bank building with 22 off-street parking spaces, an infiltration bed for stormwater management, and other associated site improvements. The subject property is zoned C3, General Commercial District and is located in the third ward. The aforesaid plans were prepared by Robert E. Blue Consulting Engineers, PC, dated December 21st, 2018, and last revised on March 15th, 2019, subject to compliance of the Planning Commission recommendations. Seconded by Commissioner Siegel. Any discussion, comments, questions on this resolution? Uh, Mr. President. Mr. Holmes. Mr. McCluskey, uh, any issues between the, um, uh, the folks, uh, Republic Bank, and any of the recommendations of the Planning Commission? Um, at last, they, they've been to the Planning Commission twice, um, and the last uh, recommendations by the Planning Commission were all agreed to and came, uh, and there was an agreement with the bank and uh, the Planning Commission, and they're all going forward, including the aesthetic improvements that are going to be consistent with the Oakmont business. Uh, district, um, so uh, it, it should should improve the aesthetics of, of that business quarter. Um, Great. That's all I have. Great. Any other comments or questions? Please call the roll. Mr. D'Amelio. Yes. Mr. Oliva. Yes. Mr. McCluskey. Yes. Mr. Siegel. Yes. Mr. McGarry. Yes. Dr. Hart. Yes. Mr. Wexler. Yes. Mr. Holmes. Yes. Mr. Lewis. Yes. Agenda item number 20, contract awards. Uh, motion to, Park, motion Parks and Rec. Rec. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Commissioner. Motion to award the tennis court rehabilitation project contract to Top A Court Hatfield PA in the amount of $438,894, submitting the lowest responsible bid. Thank you for that, uh, Commissioner. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Oliva. No. <laughs> Not. Okay, who's seconding? I'll second it. Second by Commissioner McCluskey. Uh, this was discussed, uh, the bid, there was a bid opening this, uh, I guess this past week after our work session, but this was discussed at our work session uh, in the presentation made by our Assistant Township Manager and Director of Parks, Tim Denny. Uh, so um, does anybody have questions about 
this particular award. Hearing none, we'll call the roll, please. Mr. D'Amelio? Yes. Mr. Oliva? Yes. Mr. McCluskey? Yes. Mr. Siegel? Yes. Mr. McGarity? Yes. Dr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Wexler? Yes. Mr. Holmes? Yes. Mr. Lewis? Yes. Agenda item 22, continuation of Citizens Forum for both agenda and non-agenda items. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on any topic? Yep. Chris, okay. Commissioner, former Commissioner O'Connell. Be nice to us now. Good evening, gentlemen. Chris Connell, 519 Kenmore Road. Uh, I just want to express to this board, um, when I did leave public service, but not completely, I met with Dr. Hart, and one of the things we went over, I'm sure the doctor will testify, was that huge pile of stormwater management in the lower end of the 8th Ward. I want to say to Dr. Hart and to this board, also, we're continuing. I know these grants are tough. Uh, they're up against so many other grants throughout the state. And, one ha and, and everything has to be perfect on these grants. But I thank you very much for being consistent and reapplying, especially for the uh, 224 Foster. I right? ask, please don't forget them. And you didn't. So thank you very much again for continuing to address the stormwater management problems. Uh, in the 8th Ward. Thank you very much, Dr. Hart, and, and to this board. And, and that's really all I want to say is, is thank you. It's very important. Thank you, Chris Connell. Appreciate it. Good to see you. <clears throat> Anyone else in the audience like to speak? Okay. Turning to item number 23, new business. Mr. Chairman. Mr. D'Amelio. I would ask uh, this board to just indulge me for a second. Last month, a state senator in Washington State, Maureen Walsh made a comment <coughs> while debating a bill that would give nurses uninter uninterrupted meals and breaks at work and protect them from mandatory overtime. Her comment was that the nurses have time to play cards. I find that appalling. Um, I've been in healthcare for over 30 years. I've been around nurses just as long as that time. My daughter became a nurse and recently graduated uh, Newman University for a nurse practitioner. I've, they are the hardest working group of people I've ever seen in my life. They are the first point of contact for the physician. They're their eyes and ears. They're, they're constantly with the patients and they work incredibly hard at what they do. And I would ask that this board um, send a letter to the state senator telling her that we disagree and we find her um, her comments um, appalling and that we ask that uh, she apologize which I think she tried to do but I don't think it was enough now we've sent this board has, has sent letters involving issues nationally to Congress other state representatives and even the president of the United States at my suggestion for the bump stock weapon but I ask that this is something that we know so many individuals that work in that field and how hard they work. And for this state center to get up and make such a stupid comment, to me again, is appalling. And I think that we need to support the nurses, all <coughs> nurses, male and female, that work tirelessly for patient care. All of us have needed nurses in our lives. We all have. And they're there for us 24 hours a day. And I'm asking this board if it would be okay if we said I'll, I'll lend my support. My daughter, my sister, and three sister-in-laws are all nurses, and I can attest to the fact that what you just said about how hard they work, how hard their profession is, how thankless it can be sometimes, and I'd sign that in two seconds with you. Thank you, Thank you Commissioner. Who wants to draft it? <clears throat> we'll get it drafted. Is, this, uh, is the board okay with it? Do we need? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with it. Well, I, well, if you draft it, if, if 
to look at the language. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. absolutely. We don't need to vote on it tonight. No, no, not vote on it. I just want to know, you know, we can move forward with it and we'll draft it and present it to the board. Okay, anything, anything else, uh, Mr. DeMario? Nope. Commissioner Wheeler? Um, I'd like to um, talk a little bit about the Happer Home and Garden Show. Uh, it is coming up um, the 18th is uh, preview night. Uh, so there'll be um, cost is $15 in advance, $20 at the door. Um, the, uh, that's the preview, so that'll allow you to go through. There'll be live music, raffles, um, hard cider, brew your own, um, as well as uh, coffee samples from House Cup Coffee Roasters. Uh, food is from uh, Carlino's, Brie and Latella's, Secret Sauce, uh, and more. All vendors uh, and displays will be set up uh, for the preview night, and then uh, the event is on Sunday, uh, May 19th, from 10 to 4 p.m. There'll be about 75 vendors there. The keynote speaker is uh, Jeff Devlin of uh, the DIY Network. Uh, there's a full schedule of speakers, um, food, food trucks and vendors. Um, the admission is $5 on the day of the event. Um, it's free for children under 12, and uh, it all goes up to 18 days. And that is all I have. Thank you, Commissioner Oliva. Um, we went out of order. We went to other business before we went to do, bu do business. Is there, back to agenda item number 23, is there any new business to come before this board? Okay. Uh, agenda item number 24, back to other business. Commissioner McCluskey. Um, so I like to welcome uh, Dave to uh, the board uh, to the, the Township Commissioner tonight. Um, I think tonight was uh, not necessarily reflective of some of the banter we occasionally have besides for the slight curb discussion that was an abbreviated version of one we've had. So uh, hopefully next work, next month we can have a couple more controversial things that uh, we can sit in the middle of. Um, but with, with that being said, there were a couple, um, I, I, although it was all in agreement, I, I do just want to highlight that there were um, some very important votes, as, as former Commissioner O'Connell talked about, in terms of stormwater management in the 8th Ward. We also uh, passed something in terms of supporting solar energy here in the township. So I, I think even at times, if uh, there's not lengthy discussions on, on certain issues, uh, there was important votes that did take place tonight in terms of um, the, the, the seriousness that we're taking uh, in terms of addressing stormwater management and uh, our energy consumption needs. Um, I also just wanted to touch on, in, in the third ward, uh, we had the 51st annual St. Dennis Fair over the, the last two weeks, and it was another successful event. Um, but I did want to just publicly thank, on behalf of the community, uh, all the volunteers that uh, spend countless hours. There's, there's some volunteers who it basically becomes a full-time job for them for the better part of two to three weeks. Um, and it's a, it's a nice community event where a lot of people take their kids and. Um, Families have been going there for, for generations, and it's a, it's, a, it's a nice event that we have within the township, but it's all done through the, the hard work of some a, a lot of volunteers that, that put in the time. Um, Chestnut Walled Elementary School has their, has their annual 5K uh, fundraiser, Chestnut Walled Chase, this Sunday on uh, May 19th. Um, and then also I just wanted to highlight that our Parks and Recreation Department have uh, their 5K series through the trails at the Creck. Um, it really is a, a wonderful uh, couple events. It's every, it's the last Wednesday in the month of uh, May, June and July, May, so May 29th, June 26th, and July 24th. Uh, and it gives you an opportunity to run in, in sort of the cooler evening uh, air through some of the trails that we have at the Creck. Um, and you know, every year, the past couple years that we've been there, there's been some people who are, who are not from this town and, or some people who are from Havertown um, who, who didn't even know those trails were there, so I encourage everyone to take this opportunity to uh, check out some of the some of the trails that we have at the crack. Um, and that's all I have. Thanks, Mr. Siegel. Thank you, Mr. President. I actually have a few things cooking more this month than normal. First, I want to welcome Mr. Berman. Um, I'm thrilled that you're joining us, and I'm sure um, we will see a lot of positive things in the township as we continue. You know, from Larry Gentile's leadership. Uh, so welcome. It's also nice to have a fellow Cheltenham uh, alt person. Uh, we both grew up in the same area. Uh, just a couple of other things. Uh, Hannah Turlish talked about the school district's initiatives and 
in my newsletter yesterday, I highlighted what's called the BASIS program in the public schools, which was started as a program to deal with transgender students and issues and has expanded dramatically. And I encourage people to read about it, how it really seeks to provide inclusion and a feeling of comfort for all students, uh, not just the, uh, any particular, not just transgenders. It is a marvelously successful program, and I encourage you to read about it. On a couple of Monday notes, then I'll get serious, more serious. First is we had our first shredding event, um, and we were a victim of our success. Uh, the event, uh, the truck, you know, our we overflowed the truck sooner than had been expected. We have scheduled another event in June, on June 29th, thanks to this board agreeing to provide ample funding where we will increase uh, the number of trucks and uh, make other efforts to make sure it flows even more smoothly and learn from the first event. I want to thank the chief, I want to thank public works people who were there to help uh, with that event. Uh, a reminder that the Delaware County, uh, the, the township, the Electronics Day is this Saturday from 9 to 1. Last week, uh, something that wasn't mentioned uh, uh, today with uh, the Officer of the Year and uh, those discussions was that last week we had the dedication of the POW MIA chair in the lobby uh, that was uh, overseen by Deputy Chief Viola and the other members of the police force. I mean, Deputy Chief Hagen, I'm sorry. Uh, and it was quite an event. Uh, I, I was very pleased to attend. It was very well attended. The ceremony is online at Facebook. It's the first time I had known about uh, the chair and the symbolic, uh, what it means. And I encourage people to look at that and to see um, it's, it's a very moving ceremony and a, a terrific way to remember uh, soldiers. <laughs> I'm not used to a musical accompaniment. <laughs> um, so I encourage you and I want to thank uh, uh, Deputy Chief and others for arranging that event. It was very well received. I want to move on to something that's way more serious and personal to me and it's sort of two events that sort of coalesce. I spoke about six months ago about the massacre in Pittsburgh, um, and we just suffered another at the Chabad in California. Um, again, at the hands of intolerance and hate. Uh, the Anti-Defamation League has reported that the number of instances of anti-Semitism and hate crimes continues to increase in this country, and it is a terrible and dangerous uh, trend uh, this board has, thankfully, you know, spoken out against it. Uh, but we need to continue to be vigilant. Um, the U.S. Senate is about to uh, vote on a resolution, 189. It's a bipartisan effort to condemn anti-Semitism and committing the U.S. to combat all forms of hate. Uh, we need to do that. We need to reduce the hateful rhetoric that continues to lead to shootings like the one at the Chabad. And if you have not heard the rabbi from the Chabad talk about the event and what he went through, I encourage you to do so. That is one of the most moving, uh, compelling uh, speeches I've ever heard. And in that regard, last week I had to travel to Williamsport on business. And it really brought back a memory because for many years, Williamsport was the gun running capital of Pennsylvania. People didn't realize that that was the place that was the easiest place to obtain guns cheaply in bulk and that they often ended up on the streets. I, I actually was counsel many years ago in a case in which a young child in South Philly was playing with another young child, both five or, and six, where one found a gun under a car didn't know what it was, thought it was a toy, picked it up, showed it to his friend and pulled the trigger, and the friend did not survive. That gun was traced to a dishwasher working in Williamsport who was buying guns in bulk, and as a result, uh, those guns were found throughout 
the state, including that one under a car in South Philadelphia. The dishwasher was tracked down and went to jail for a period of time, but it doesn't bring back the lies. <laughs> but it does bring back an issue that is now in the forefront in Pennsylvania, because our state Senate has a bill, 531, that is being considered that would further restrict the ability of municipalities, such as Haverford, the city of Philadelphia, and others, to enact any type of regulation, such as one that would require the owner of a weapon that is lost or stolen to report that weapon to the, the lost or stolen weapon to the police. Often, with gun running, what happens is that guns are lost or stolen, but they are really sold. Uh, and having spent years working on this issue, I could tell you that's the case. I didn't want to bring it up as a new business item, but I will be bringing it up next month, that I urge this board to oppose that bill and anything else that in creates further restrictions on things like the need to report a lost or stolen gun so that in the event it does turn up in, the, in a crime or a tragedy, um, like the one in South Philadelphia from many years ago, that the police are able to take appropriate efforts. Uh, this bill, uh, which had previously passed and was declared unconstitutional for other reasons by our state Supreme Court, is typical of efforts to prevent anyone from taking any efforts to try to do practical solutions. And, you know, we see too much tragedy, too many violence, too much violence from the Chabad to our streets to our children. And we've got to do whatever we can to make it so that we and our children are not afraid to go to school, that none of us is afraid to go to our religious institutions and pray uh, to whomever and however we believe. Um, and it is time to do that, even if we take small. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Siegel. Uh, Commissioner McGarry. Commissioner. Me? Gosh, look at you next. <laughs> thank you, Andy. Uh, listen, uh, thank you, Connor Quinn, for those nice words you said about me, and the speech that you made tonight was beautiful, and I encourage you to keep speaking, speaking out on things, and that's why I have a lot of faith in Connor Quinn. And Mr. Connell, thank you for coming up about the 8th Ward with, with uh, Jerry. Uh, I know you and Jerry worked hard on that for years to get that resolved, and it's finally res it's getting resolved, so that's great. And uh, basically, just want to remind everybody, next not tomorrow, but next Tuesday is Election Day, and go out and vote. That's why we gave you the right to vote, to go out and vote for the candidate of your choice, he or she. Thank you. Commissioner Hart. Yes, I just want to uh, welcome Dave. Uh, looking forward to working with you, and to thank Amy for all your hard work in the transition period. You were wonderful. Uh, Chris, thank you for your kind words, and I can assure you that I'll continue to work uh, to continue the work that you started to try to uh, work on the stormwater issues and prevent the flooding. And then finally, tomorrow evening at 6.30, um, Parks and Rec Director Tim Denny and I are going to meet with residents in Chatham Glen to talk about plans for upgrades to the, to the park and, and to get um, input from residents on things that they would like to see done, um, weather committee, and all residents are welcome to attend. Thank you, Commissioner Hart. Commissioner Wexler. Thank you, Mr. President. First, I'd like to thank Ms. Sop for coming to this evening. It's through our neighbors' vigilance that they make us aware of problems in the neighborhood. Her insight and quick response to me, and then thankfully the response of the owner of the quarry site and the management company, uh, and now their continued maintenance. They're on top of it. Our coast department's monitoring it. Our police department is now patrolling the back of that shopping center where there's a homeless man living there. And if, if it wasn't pointed out, it might have gone unnoticed. So thank you very much for your uh, caring for the neighborhood, really. It's, uh, it's good that it's so. Uh, thank you, Mario, for bringing up the Home and Garden Show on the 19th. Uh, my next constituent meeting is at the Hilltop Civic Association next Thursday, the 23rd, at Bonaire Fire Company. Uh, David, I'd like to welcome you and also thank Amy for her hard work. It was a couple good months for her. And I'm sure she's glad you're here, and her phone can go off at night. So, 
And then uh, lastly, I'd like to not only recognize and congratulate Officer Traveling. Every year, I'm, I'm constantly amazed. We have these nice officers come up, get his wife Meg and his baby Isabella. And I, I know John pointed it out, but every year we get these great young guys that stand before us as Officer of the Year. And it's, I, I, you know, I know they're, they're all humble guys, and, but they represent an entire department. For every officer Mike Traveling, there's, there's four others. I think every year, it, it's just so impressive to see them. I think we're lucky, we're fortunate to have such a professional department with young guys coming up to, to fill in the ranks. Not that John's getting long in the tooth or anything, but, uh, but we have, we've, got, we've got a young department coming up with great people, great second level of leaders, good sergeants, good lieutenants, and obviously great officers because they, these supervisors have a hard time every year picking those guys. And they're all, everyone that stands up here was family. I'm proud to say that we, uh, we have them representing our township out in the street every day and, and offering, you know, sacrificing their lives at some point, hopefully never, but uh, protecting us all the time. So that's, it's just an impressive and that's a nice thing to see every year. So that's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner Wexler. Go home. Uh, Mr. President, thanks. Um, I want to thank Ms. Huff for her words and for sharing with us um, an editorial from the newspaper last month, right, on the eve of local government week. So since we're welcoming a new township manager, um, I just thought I'd share a couple of words from this, um, from this lovely editorial that you shared with us. Just imagine, though, what it would be like if your township didn't exist and your community was managed by a larger centralized government. Under this scenario, which has been proposed in the past, you would have to approach a more distant group of elected leaders, some of whom may be familiar with your community, most of whom may not, and compete against a much larger pool of individuals to get your voice heard and needs met. Local democracy, as you know it, would be lost and replaced with a bigger and more sluggish way of governing. So as we celebrate Local Government Week, here's something to keep in mind. Township government isn't just another layer of government the critical layer, the foundation. It's the one that represents you and your family, lives within its budget, and provides the services you've asked for, nothing more and nothing less. The next time you're out and about, take a good look around your township and realize all the good things you see, parks, well-maintained roads, and the safe environment to raise your family, are possible because your local leaders, your neighbors, had a vision and turned it into a reality for you. So, uh, welcome to our township, Dave. You get to be part of this, and it's something that's a privilege for the rest of us. And now I hope a privilege for you. So, next Tuesday is primary day. Primary is principally, primary election day is a, is a, is, is a day for political parties. And I'm, I'm making this pitch now to all of the independents out there in Pennsylvania who decided that their party had gone too far in one direction or too far in another and decided to abandon their party and become independents. By doing so, they've limited their votes to the fall in the general election. And by that time, it's too late for them to influence the group of people that they used to ally themselves with, to try to nominate a candidate who may be more palatable more people than somebody who reaches out just to the extreme levels of their, of their party. So I, I ask all the independents out there to rethink your independence, not from, you know, from undue influences, but rethink your allegiance or rethink a new allegiance to another party to help moderate it in the primary election to make our general elections more meaningful. And everybody who can next week, please go out and vote. Educate yourself before you do, uh, and help keep our democracy what it is. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Commissioner Holmes. Uh, just like to first congratulate uh, Deputy Chief Hagan on his recognition from the Race for Peace. Congratulations. Also, want to thank thank Amy again and uh, welcome David. So I look forward to working with you for many years to come. Um, I would like to just raise an issue that I have in the fifth ward, and it relates to cell phone coverage. And I don't know whether my fellow commissioners or residents in other parts of the 
Tufts have had the same experience, but in the Cooperstown section of the Fifth Ward, um, you basically have to be in a certain room uh, to make a phone call uh, in, your own, in your own home. So a lot of people have gotten rid of their landline and rely on their cell phone. But they have to be in a particular room in their house to make a call because they have maybe one bar, maybe less than one bar. Uh, and it's so bad in the Cooperstown Elementary School that you can't even make a phone call from Cooperstown Elementary School, which is a safety issue. Teachers should be able to make a call in emergency situation or, you know, or personal calls in their uh, free time. So uh, it's a real issue in the Fifth Ward, particularly in the Cooperstown sec section. And what's interesting is, and Amy did this research for me, and thank you, Amy, um, the actual, it's actually with AT&T and Verizon that the problem's with, and what's interesting is that they're actually on the tower at Howard, Haverford Reserve, so they're literally, uh, you know, a mile as a crow flies from where the issue is, if that. Uh, and I'm probably two miles from that tower, and I get two or three bars on Verizon. Uh, this is a very serious issue for the residents up there, uh, and it's a serious safety issue, I think, for the school to not be able to make phone calls, cell calls from Cooperstown. And I'd like to uh, have this board go on record with, uh, with Greg Vitale. Uh, he, he's familiar with the issue, Senator Leach. Uh, more importantly, I think we should do a resolution to the uh, Public Utility Commission and also to Verizon and AT&T to compel them um, I mean, I have to think there's technology. Uh, if they can reach my house with two or three bars two miles away, uh, it, it seems to me there's no reason why they can't reach Cooperstown. Uh, that's you know less than probably a mile away. So uh, I'd like to work on a resolution to present to this board uh, at next month's work session to address this issue and hopefully uh, hopefully solve this problem in Cooperstown. I don't know whether any other commissioners have any s similar coverage issues. Andy, are the, the people paying their People paying their bills up there when they're not getting the service. Yeah, no. I mean, I wouldn't pay. I'll be honest with you. Well, I, w I said to people they could they could switch coverage. I mean, they could switch to a different ca carrier. Clearly, uh, but I don't know whether that would make a difference. But um, anyway, is any? Well, I'm all for you. I mean, yeah, okay. I, I agree with the proclamation and all. Do you want to just come up? I'm sorry. Do you want to just come up and just identify yourself? Sorry. Not that we should have a continuation of the forum, but we'll uh, Michelle Alvarez, 134 Hastings Avenue. We have the same issue in Oakmont. We're too close to the tower at the township building. Even standing outside our houses, we have trouble making phone calls. So it's not it's it's the proximity to the tower, yeah. and they don't shoot down right or something. I don't know, but we can't make calls out of our houses either. So okay, cool. well, the third that's the third ward. Yeah, third ward. Okay, Oakmont. Okay. Well, you'd think in this day and age they'd be able to figure that out. <laughs> they, they do. We keep fighting those little antennas. The technology's changing. Got to get on the smaller antennas are going on the telephone poles, and that's covering the dead spot and reporting back to the higher. Is that is that what would that be the solution? That would be the solution. Also, you have construction issues with different types of buildings. Too. Okay. Uh, Eight radio propagation within the buildings is, is difficult, depending on the construction. So. I'd just like to bring it before this board for consideration for for next month. Do you have something to say, Commissioner? Well, it's a double-edged sword. People get very concerned in much more tightly uh, populated neighborhoods. You know, 20 people on the block want extra coverage, but it goes on one person's telephone pole 22 feet from their child's room. And folks, rightly or wrongly, get concerned about those get concerned about those boosters. I've certainly had plenty of issues in the Sixth Ward and a lot of people angry with me. Um, when uh, when when different um, carriers came in and basically forced themselves on us in this particular location, and they they have that right. In fact, my words to Jim Byrne were, "They'll put that up when a court orders me to do so." It took about six weeks, and then a court ordered us to do it. So, um, it's uh, I, you know, I had said at the time, "I'll gladly take one in my own on, on my own." You know, yard just to tell people that I think it's safe. Um, but you are still dealing with folks that are concerned about technology and about um, harm that could come from um, from the extra power uh, that they think uh, is associated with um, with these boosters. Um, and it isn't. It, it's 
as opposed to asking the state to do something about it, is really a function of the carriers getting enough pressure from folks to realize that they're going to lose their customers to their competitors if they don't keep the power in these areas. So, um, I will. I mean, I mean, I, we've had the exact opposite problem in the in the sixth board. I mean, no, we don't have great coverage everywhere, but we have bigger issues with people trying to stop the installation of the of the new technology as opposed to desperately seeking to have its installation. Well, I mean, you look here to put one on your own property. I put one up. Like you, I'll yeah. do it on my property. <laughs> and there are also signal extenders available. Uh, that will boost the signal within an area. So that I have, I put one in my office probably about a dozen years ago and have never had an issue since. Uh, and I, maybe you can send me, send me the link. I mean, I was looking, they still make them. I didn't even know because it's been so long. Okay, well, we'll look at that issue at the work session next, uh, next month. Uh, and that's all I have. So anything else before this board? If not, we stand adjourned. Thank you.